thanks for all the discussions and uh, let's welcome our next keynote speaker, uh, Christian K. Meyer, managing partner at Sustly Capital, and then Christian is the managing partner uh, at the blockchain venture fund Sustly Capital. As Forbes contributors, he writes and speaks on the implications of technology and for society and finance. So without further ado, let's welcome uh, Christian to the stage. I like audience participation, so everybody get up, please, for me. I'm going to do a little questionnaire here. Everybody, come on, come on. It's going to be the exercise for the day. Uh, first of all, everybody who owns an NFT can already sit down at this point in time. Then anybody who owns Ether, the reward mechanism on Ethereum, you cannot buy Ethereum, you can only buy Ether, sit down for me. And then lastly, anybody who owns Bitcoin, sit down. <laughs> anybody who's still standing, please leave the room by Bitcoin. Anyway, no, stay, stay. Do it afterwards. Anyway, so I have a quirky intro for you, if it's playing. Okay, this is my old presentation, so ignore the presentation. Anyway, we want to start you off with some axioms. Humans are startup species. We've only been around for some 350,000 years. 99% of all species that ever inhabited the planet here over the last 4 billion years doesn't exist anymore, and we are going to face the same if we don't collaborate. The success of the human species so far depends primarily on our ability to collaborate. So that's what I'm going to talk about in very detail. Today, societies function on incentivized cooperation. Our fundamental technology to do so is language. The primary incentive technology, so to facilitate cooperation, are currencies. So we're going to talk a little bit about that and the confusion. What are currencies trying to solve? Uh, you have a bag of rice, I have some chicken, we don't know the exchange rate from chicken to rice, so we came up with instruments that we call currencies. Today it's called the coincidence of once problem. And then usually today what we use to solve that is some, some application, and you might use a currency called Bitcoin, you might use a currency called the US dollar, you might use a currency called the Euro or something else. Globally, mostly, this is done using the US dollar. This is global GDP last year, about $96 trillion. And it's by and large dominated as a unit of account by the US dollar, as you can see here, and in the cross-border invoicing. I promise it's going to get more interesting. Everybody familiar with this picture? That's what we usually have in mind when we use the term money and you may or may not be right about its facility as money. We're going to get into that. What you just saw is actually our most, and by our, I mean the United States, most profitable export product, and by revenue only exceeded by refined oil products. So we have about $2.1 trillion of these Federal Reserve notes, of this cash flying around, and uh, almost half of that is flying around in other countries today. So today, this is the left part. Cash is about 2.3 trillion, but most money is being created by commercial banks. And it's mitigated and it's transferred by commercial banks. And then there's a smaller portion, which is a subset of that. These are non-banks, so this is uh, the PayPal's of the world. So what's good about cash? cash is Great, because I hand it to you. It settles the transaction with some finality, you could say. I don't need to see a passport. I don't need to involve a third party that might extract something. By and large, that's obviously not true for anything that's mitigated by commercial banks. Unfortunately, because we're living in a digital world, this is the velocity of cash today. Velocity simply means how many times the dollar turns over that's in circulation. So you can see it's about four times in a given year. So that's why today only 3% of transaction amounts, actually the transactions themselves are a little higher, are conducted in cash and many people in the room probably haven't used cash for quite some time at all. Mostly you're going to use debit cards, credit cards and so forth. 
This should be at the end, but I'm going to talk about here right now. So, I told you earlier, global GDP last year was $96 trillion. This is the revenue that financial service providers made last year. The way I like to formulate that is the legacy financial system and the technology they're employing exerts a 23% penalty on the real economy. So up until a decade ago, we didn't have peer-to-peer -peer cash. Obviously, everybody in, here in the room is familiar with peer-to-peer -peer cash now. At least that's what, was, what Bitcoin was trying to introduce. 99%, unfortunately, um, a lot of misconfigured exceptions in that realm, don't understand cryptocurrencies, don't understand the economies, and like John Hollywood likes to say, cryptocurrencies come on everything no one understands about technology, with everything no one understands about money. If you went to business school, you probably learned this definition of money as a unit of account store of value and medium of exchange. It was wrong when Jevons wrote it in 1875, and it's wrong today, and people keep using it, including the Federal Reserve. I'll explain to you why. The unit of account, I showed you that picture earlier. So I can show you my Bitcoin in US dollars, I can show it to you in euros, I can show it to you in yen. So the unit of account in the digital space is an interface function. That's all it is. Stores of value today look like this. People store their value in stocks, in bonds, maybe in certificate of deposits if they don't know a better use case, mortgages, and you see the small amount down there, which if you add all of checking accounts and all of cash outstanding out there, you get about just under 3%. So the use case of store of value for money, which really is currency, I'll explain what I mean by that, is about 3%, so by and large, people don't use it like that. If you're using it like that, by and large, you're using it wrong. This is the medium of exchange. Anybody telling you otherwise is just mistaken from a functional perspective. By the way, uh, the right side is the dollar's worth of USD, as of dollar. And the left side is a billion dollars worth of Bitcoin. So what's my point? And this is a common confusion in the space that came up in both talks before me. It's a conflation of currency and money. It's a conflation of use cases and functions. If you have a hammer, the function of the hammer is always the same. It centralizes centrifugal force. And your usual use case might be to put a nail in the wall. If I use it to bash someone's head in, I didn't touch the functionality of that hammer at all. And we don't put labels like murder weapon on a hammer. That, by the way, is what Gary Gensler is trying to do. That's the confusion here. Functions and use cases, and it goes down the line. So typically, if Bob wants to send Alice some money, he's going to instruct his bank of no returns to update his ledger, who then instructs Alice's ledger at bank of even lesser returns using digital, digital means, and usually you got another two and a half parties in that mix that usually will extract some value. So I have a very simplified presentation here of how the opposite works. So you got Bob, and this is explaining cryptography to a kindergartner level. And Bob wants to send money to Alice. He puts his money into a box, puts his lock on there, sends his box to Alice. Alice puts on her own lock, sends it back to Bob. Box. Bob, at that point in time, takes off his lock, sends it back to Alice. Alice now has the box with her own key, and that's how a transaction works. Again, the kindergarten level of cryptography. Blockchains are not ledgers. Blockchains are not databases. If you read the Bitcoin white paper, it never mentions the word ledger for very good reason. It's the opposite. Think about it. The title is peer-to-peer -peer cash. Last time someone gave you cash, did you get a ledger with that? I don't think so. I skip over DAOs. We talked about this and we can talk about it at the end if you want to. But what's the primary difference here? The primary difference is what I talked about in the beginning. The difference is between corporation versus collaboration. As I mentioned, 
cooperation requires an incentive model. You need to exchange value, typically currency in our digital world today. So that's why Bitcoin, even though obviously there were some 750 people who contributed to it at some point in time, at any given point in time, has nine core developers. And you see, by the way, how many, as an example here, JP Morgan, how many employees they have, which also incidentally then kind of debunks that usual claim that Bitcoins in any shape or form negative for the environment. Think about the quarter million people that turn on their car in the morning and turn on their computer. Anyway, you can see and read the, the revenues themselves. Point there being is it's way more efficient if and when and where people that collaborate towards a particular outcome do not need an external incentive system that uses intermediaries. And you can make many of these examples. When, you say, when you say employees, I'm sorry. Sure. How about the machines that are on the network? Are they are they considered employees that create the public network? The oh, that's a much larger discussion we can have. Okay, no, sorry, yeah. go ahead. Um, so obviously, in all these comparisons, needless to say, is going to be somewhat apples to oranges because they're all not the same. Ethereum is, has the ambition to kind of be in this global compute network and so forth. Okay. But again, you can use it to transfer value. And you see, just one of those, what I call actually. I toned it down and I called it in my update for fintech, but it's very important to realize fintech is a marketing term that was invented by an advertising company. And it was specifically used for window dressing solutions to the legacy financial system, like PayPal. So what we call decentralized finance today is the actual first fintech. There was no fintech before the emergence of decentralized blockchain solutions, but decentralized software solutions, blockchain being one example of that. But then what we do is, so we run an actual thesis-driven fund. So we're using the scientific method. We have our own research and development team, we have our own um, data science team. We just do fundamental analysis. So if you like, just use, look at Bitcoin's current use case, what is Bitcoin used for? So we consider something an investment. If you're buying it and you're expecting to own it for the next five years. Again, you can use your own definition. You can call it three or seven. But in my opinion, if you're expecting to sell it next year, you're not investing, you're speculating. And so that's why we differentiate it here. And then we have this small sliver that you can call payments today and that might eventually increase with second layer solutions. <laughs> Unfortunately, we call these things cryptocurrencies. Terrible, terrible trouble. By now, you should have realized currencies are technologies. Money is a legal concept. If I hand over a Federal Reserve note to you, your acceptance as a form of payment makes it money. Before that, it was a piece of paper, actually cotton and leather, but you get my point. Uh, then there was a lot of confusion previously, again, with the basic definitions. Coins are the native mining reward mechanism. Tokens are standardized smart contracts. That's all they are. Um, and usually peer-to-peer -peer bearer instrument on public blockchains. As soon as you anchor it, you kind of remove that particular function. That's why whenever you hear platform, it's the end, at the end of its tokenness. And we can talk about that more, but um, we looked at more than 2,000 projects over the past decade, and probably a year longer, if you consider that we have been investing in decentralized software solutions for the past 22 years. Again, blockchain <coughs> is somewhat a nuanced version of that with a very, very small footprint, really. You should only use a blockchain-based implementation for a singular function, which is to change control over a set of bytes from one address to another. So whenever you use it for something else, you most likely what we call in our due diligence process invalidating the herd immunity of the blockchain. If you're creating an immutable record out of PII, you can start over. You can no longer comply with certain laws and regulation. Side note, I give to our just presentations on, on that topic. But till, still to this day, I get emails and decks that proclaim blockchain adoption, cryptocurrency adoption. Well, my response is always the same. Okay, who is adopting it? Why are they adopting it? When and how they are adopting it? Which typically gets a lot of silence because the developer hasn't really thought about that. They just thought, okay, that makes for a good battle cry, which in principle I agree with, but in practicality, you still need to build an application. So we're going to continue comparing some of those centralized and decentralized, really, uh, collaboration and cooperation. 
So we got now a public company in the crypto space again. Air quotes because obviously Coinbase operates database solutions, right? So they're adjacent to the decentralized software solution space, which then expresses itself with a comparison against an actual decentralized application where you have Uniswap with like a fraction of the employees um, with about the same trading volume, which achieved it in about three years versus a decade with Coinbase. But when you actually observe, simply take apart the current use case of decentralized software solution, DeFi use cases, you see it's mostly decentralized exchanges, you've got some landing, got some bridges, and then what I find most interesting is CDPs, which is short for collateralized with debt protocols, but I'm going to explain in more detail later. And then other things like algorithmic stable coins and so forth. By and large, these labels are very, very unhelpful. So people try to classify this as commodity network stable coins. You always have to look at every single transaction on their own merit, right? Just like I can give you a Federal Reserve note and you decide to make origami with that, or you set it on fire, I have no insights of it to that, right? Because within that original exchange, there is usually no expression to the point, what are you going to do with what, I, what you are receiving? That's true for currency, what people keep calling money. That's obviously true for several orders of magnitudes if you're exchanging control or a set of bytes. I have no clue what you're doing with that, and I don't need to know. For all intents and purposes, instantly, when any of those things hit your wallet, you have a little bot running that converts it into BTC because that's your store value. I don't know. Right? It's outside of my purview. It's not part of the agreement that we enter it, usually. So then we have quote unquote stable coins. Again, terrible, terrible term. Uh, obviously, nothing stable about it. If you um, hinge yourself to a sinking ship, you're still going to sink. And so that's why. It's very confusing to me that you can just read the actual use cases of the largest stablecoin by volume right now, which is Tether, which is basically to just trade it against another cryptocurrency, so for gambling or speculative reasons, and that's 99% of its use case. What is the sinking there? The US dollar. <laughs> There's always going to be more. Right? It's not never going to be less, so it's not stable. Right? If something is inflating, you can call that stable, but you're just lying. So, one last comparison, I think. So, we got a really cool company, Lending Club, cool for its time. Uh, it has about a thousand employees, took it 16 years to reach its current uh, loan origination level of just over 10 billion. Other decentralized lending protocol reached the same in just four years and obviously has a fraction of the employees. Again, collaboration, cooperation. I'm going to skip through that. This is why we're technical. Um, this is one of the most interesting concepts, collateralized debt protocols. So the way currency is created today, I mentioned that earlier, is through commercial banking by the process of lending. It's usually over collateralized lending. Think about your typical mortgage where you pledge a house that might be worth a million dollars and you gain get like a six or six hundred thousand, eight hundred thousand dollar loan. So the same mechanism um, that the bank charges you for in, in that process creates new currency, right? And the reason why you know that, by the way, a lot of people think banks are intermediaries, they're not intermediaries. Commercial banks create most of the money in the world through the process of lending. They're not intermediaries and it's really easy to explain because we have quote unquote alternative lending. Alternative means I already have the money that I give you. That's the alternative. That's how you become an alternative lender. So now we have collateralized debt protocols. So I have a number of Ether. I have 50 Ether. I can deposit it into a smart contract system. Let's use MakerDAO for our example. I have to usually over collateralize that. This represents the average of the offers that we have um, as of last week, I believe. And I can borrow at the moment about 150,000 DAIs so or $150,000 from any of these smart contracts in a given point in time. There's no bank involved, there's no institution fee involved. Um, the lowest interest rate you can get right now is zero. That's basically your balance at 50. Yes. 
All right, so you, you deposit, I'm going to use this graph again. You deposit your ETH, you take out the DAI. And if you ever want to get your ETH back, you just deposit the DAI again. So, point here being is there's a lot of unhelpful metaphors in our space. Um, like blockchains are protocols, blockchains are not protocols because they exist in a network environment, context matters. Meaning, if I tell you I saw a Jaguar in the parking lot, you're thinking car. If I told you I saw a Jaguar in the zoo, you're probably thinking animal. So blockchains are applications. And uh, you should use these applications all for, for this only purpose here. An example calls it digital vending machines. It's probably one of the most helpful metaphors. And again, you should only use a blockchain for the function to change and control over set of bytes from A to B. Never store anything in a blockchain. Blockchains are not storage devices. Big picture. So we started out with commercial activities being mitigated first simply through our brain power. I would remember that you owed me a bunny rabbit and a couple days later, I asked you back for the bunny rabbit or some, something else that would sustain me. Then eventually we invented play tables and then ultimately paper and before the invention of databases in the 60s, we co conducted most of our commercial activity using paper. But with the digitalization, so the, with the invention of database solutions, most of the activity moved to database solutions. And then we made a rather big mistake. We connected these databases to network technologies. They were not designed to be connected to network technologies. Externalities from databases last year exceeded $6 trillion. That's larger than the GDP of most countries with the exception of China and the United States. On current trajectory, it will exceed $10 trillion. And remember, global GDP last year stood at $96 trillion. Point here being is, it's non-optional to move away from database solutions. What we need is, I call it here decentralization because people keep calling it that, it's more nuanced. What we need is what I call nerdy, a network of mapped cryptographic primitives. Blockchain are one example of decentralized software solutions, there are many others. Um, direct asymmetric graphs are probably more important. NFTs as a concept are probably more important. Big picture is, we haven't developed the World Wide Web. We developed the commercial web. If you are using Google, you're not on the World Wide Web. You're not a player character in a game called Google. Google doesn't index the World Wide Web. Well, they say they do. Yeah, it's a lie. Um, Google also doesn't sell advertising. Google sells social engineering as a service to the highest bidder. So this just explains the network step that's being developed, so I hate the term Web3. We've been using it on and off for more than 20 years at this point in time, but really, we're developing the World Wide Web for the first time right now. A lot of these companies we've invested in, and they will lead towards building the World Wide Web. And what's ironic is, the lowest hanging fruit, the simplest problem to solve, is all the money in the world. It has been technically solved, for more than 30 years. Uh, my doctor thesis that I never got around to defend was on telecommunication law. So we had final settlement on global telecommunication networks for 30 years. So that's not the problem, it's an incumbent problem. I have a lot more slides, but I'm gonna leave this now for question and answers. Um, I'm working on a book called Streaming Money that we're going to publish next year. I usually publish a few times a year long nerdy articles on Hacker Noon that you guys are probably familiar with and then the consumer version of that on Forbes a few times a year. Um, I share the banking and finance sick at the Decentralized Identity Foundation that we're going to first invalidate the current implementation of EML that we call KYC which is simply an excuse for wholesale surveillance and evasion of your Fourth Amendment rights. All right, uh, as I said, I'm going to leave it here for questions and answers. Wow. Eli, okay. Gentleman in the black sweater. 
Uh, hi, my name is Peter. I currently work for MEFC, which is one of the top uh, crypto exchanges in the world and number one in all of Asia. Um, what makes us unique is that we have one of the largest listings of uh, DeFi tokens today, about 1,900. And I just want to know your thoughts on two topics. Um, what do you think the future is for yield farming for uh, companies like Urine Finance? Um, as well as uh, social finance. So at the current state of technology, so as an investor, uh, for us it's all about timing, right? Being too early is the same as being wrong. So in the context of technology investing, it's about timing the technology and the pieces that are coming together. The current state of what we call cryptocurrency markets is basically that of a multi-massive online player game that's disconnected <coughs> from real world economic activity. Which by the way, it's not a diss. We should have done this before we unleashed Correct. the current solutions on the real economy that we're using right now. So it's in this experimental phase. So we're going to see a phase shift if and when and where we're going to start quote unquote tokenizing real world assets. We're gonna, we are seeing this in very small steps. There was a French bank who just did a make a out transaction of like 20 million euros, by the way. Anyway, so larger point there being though is you cannot tokenize anything that's not digitally native. Right? So when, like when people keep telling you today, I tokenize the house, that's like a child saying I took a picture of my phone of the house, and now it's digital, right? That's not understanding technology or legal concepts for that matter. So we're working with teams in Africa and other countries where there are no incumbents that hold us back, where we can build things like decentralized land registries using NFT principles. So at that point in time, yes, you can envision, you can collateralize those and commit them to a landing protocol. And so, again, this is a high-level answer to your very specific question, but that's how we think about this in terms of how this technology is going to progress. And yes, we, we need all these kind of, let's call them liquidity markets, but then also we need way more education to get Gary Gensler and other people to understand that they're either entirely mistaken or just using um, their particular office as a campaign platform, as I think most people in the, in the room will know. So that's why we do, we've been doing education in this space for more than a decade now. Uh, we're in SoCal, we've been running the Ethereum meetups in so Southern California for the last decade. So you, you can usually join us once a month for those. Thank you. The gentleman in the front definitely has a question. <laughs> no, 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 I'm, 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 I'm enjoying what, what you're saying. I, I, I'm concerned that there's no foundation. Like when you have a house, you have to start with the foundation. When you have a house, first of all, thank you. It was a phenomenal talk, and uh, I'm hoping to get more information from your posts. But my concern is, I mean, I, I, there are two things. One the question I would have is, how come things of value that are building blocks for Web 3.0 aren't valuable? In other words, if we're going to use decentralized storage, we know we need decentralized storage. We need decentralized storage. You just need to add it. If it you, you made the point, you can centralize. So we need that infrastructure and forget the problems of, of the governance issue and the politics of decentralization. Let's just assume that we, think that we have decentralization. The question is, um, you know, you have to build a house, you need a foundation. Well, in Web3, you need identity, and so you have to agree on the identity. Yeah, I can piggyback exactly on that. If you have an iPhone, open up the, the native Apple wallet. There's a little plus sign that you will see on the upper right-hand side. When you push that, you will see that three states are on there that now let you import your digital driver's license. You store that on the enclave on the iPhone. What's my point? So just like you indicated, Every right is downstream at the moment from government-issued credentials. Right? You don't have a passport, you basically don't exist, you can de deploy the enforcement mechanisms of the nation state, you cannot associate an asset, you can't even open a bank account. So now that we have digitally native credentials, there's one other com uh, state that's doing that, that's Louisiana, who actually was first, they're just not using Apple. But now that you have it, what you have is, you have a cryptographic primitive that you can attach to a transaction only if that's needed, and that's already how it's used. In Louisiana, you get pulled over, and you show your driver's license in a way that doesn't disclose all your personal identifiers. The data also talks to TSA at the airport, where it just basically passes on a green check mark, because TSA is not interested in your first and last name, and 
where we're living. Point there being is technology only has the option to integrate with reality. So as a regulator, I can say things like I'm passing law, you're not passing laws, you're, you're creating rules. You can follow rules or ignore them. I think we, for the most part, my trophy, I don't uh, remember using 65 miles hour as my, my guiding limit. This is, you, you're obviously really bright, and I mean, this has been a really amazing talk. I, I have to say that um, I, I'm, uh, I'm interested in understanding um, I, I think I'll, I'll take it offline with you. Is that how I yeah. So, meaning these things create forcing functions. So, yeah, what, what I'm saying is credentials themselves are important for, for the validation and verification for you to do everything, to transact on the ecosystem. I'm asking about the, the identity validation, the KYC, um, and how that, you know, so I give a separate three-hour talk about that, but you have to differentiate between identification, verification, certification, authentication, and there's other legal layers. Let, you said collaboration was very important in the very beginning, right? If, you can't, if we don't collaborate on what the standards are going to be for interoperability, for verification of zero-knowledge type hidden thing proofs, I think that's really what I wanted to ask you about. So where does the collaboration have to be? Agnostic, chain agnostic. Yes. It's usually going to be on the level of a persona. And again, here it's important to understand basic taxonomy in that space. We're usually talking about identity. Uh, in our space, actually, that's not what we're doing. Right? It's not about identity. Identity requires consciousness. What we're talking about is persona. So persona, to simplify this massively, is the data that you control within a given environment. Let's call it LinkedIn. The data that you have access to is your persona. You can change that. And there's a profile which is created by the um, company that controls that particular platform to profile mm -hmm. you, right? So the point there being is, for the most part, if you're doing commercial activity, commercial activity at scale, you're not, not usually interested in identity, right? So you're interested in a particular function. And so point there being is what is needed and what we're seeing being developed is all these reputation networks where you onboard certain qualities about an individual, about a certain task. So think about people that create certain documents, let's say a doc worker, like adding data to a spreadsheet or otherwise when receiving goods and services. If and when and where this particular individual can be rated on this particular function through a decentralized network, then I make my decision just simply on the fact this individual performed this particular function a thousand times before, five-star rating, we're going to leave him as a network performance. I'm, I'm going to hire him to the, do this particular task. Because ultimately, and again, that's the fallacy is to think about NFTs as like these jumping jiffies. NFTs are the most important principle for data integrity. That's the underlying function. It's just a data integrity function. Right now, 47% of all data that sits in supply chains is just simply wrong in one way or another. And so there's two ways that I can quote unquote onboard data to a decentralized network. A, I generate it in this particular data integral um, way to begin with. Let's say an IoT device that produces certain widgets, creates a digital clone at the same point in time, and I move the digital clone along with the supply chain when I move the real world item. But a lot of things already exist. And so if and when and where I hand over my dry cleaning receipt, I always think about, okay, I want that as an NFT. And I want all the metadata that comes with that. I want it timestamped, I want the location, I want the rating of the individual handing it to me. I just want my clothes. I want my clothes. I'm, well, I'm kidding. It, it, it become, the point being is it becomes a programmable thing. Right? You, you can't program on that paper receipt. So that's why we already have investments in that space where companies start onboarding papers as NFTs to make them reliable and move them forward through the system and just show this is the real reliable document. Okay. But we have just some ways to go. We're missing just a lot of these primitives, and just like you said. So we have decentralized storage solutions. There's, there are a dozen right, right now. They're just hard to use, but we're already seeing companies building middleware layers to interact with them where you can then, as a developer, choose do you want an AWS EC2 bucket or do you want to store it on Argon for something else. And that's what we need, ease of use of the dispatcher. 
Anyway, it wasn't quite the talk I expected to give, but I, I won with the presentation that I see. Thank you guys.